Hi everyone, it's Dr. Julio Novoa. Hi everyone, it's Danielle. I'm um, sorry we're starting late, so go ahead and take a few minutes to okay. sign on. Okay, I'm going to share it. Hold on. What do I do from here? Did you hit share? Exit? Look for the video? Hi everyone. We're just sharing it to certain pages, so give us a minute here. And excuse me, because I am a little sick. Did you do it? Here. Mm -hmm. I'll do it from here. Okay. Your mouse goes really fast. It's efficient. Which which one are the pages? Um post tubal sure? ligation. Uh you sure too, right? Yes, no? but I think the post tubal ligation patients were most interested. They're the ones that uh, asked me to speak. You could kind of start talking. I'm just going to share, share this. Okay, well, I had a, a very nice list of, well, I hadn't printed it out yet. I put it on my phone. And, of course, since we're using my phone, I can't access it right now. So I'm going to have to wing this of the 12 points that I had, um, had written down. So um, let's give everybody a few more minutes to sign on. And I thought we were going to be able to do this as a simultaneous uh, cast on YouTube. However, I still haven't uh, confirmed that the camera that we're using for that uh, particular uh, simultaneous broadcast is is up to speed as far as the volume is concerned on the mics. And so I I wanted to go ahead and just continue using the our phone. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to go for the next video or uh, live presentation on that. Uh, okay. One thing, that if you could if you could all answer this question to make sure that our mics are working properly that there's no hissing sound that you may hear because well, it's if that's, me sniffling. well <laughs> she's sniffling but that's not a hiss she only hisses when she's mad but uh so anyway my cat <laughs> if uh if you hear a hissing sound and one of the one of the uh, mics is um the battery's not working as well as it should so we'll have to switch that out but if you can hear us okay then then we're we're, we're fine to go from here all right, so did you want to clear the, uh, the, the, or can you follow along on your phone? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I got a, a, a few responses and questions related to uh, getting a tubal ligation and getting a reversal of a tubal ligation, and I had posted something that a lot of people um, don't understand, especially related to eShore and the reversal of a tubal ligation with the eShore device. Tubal ligations... Uh, are very dependent on the reversal of a tubal ligation is very dependent on the manner that in which it was done how much of the tube was destroyed how much of the tube is preserved uh, any scar tissue that's around the tubes as they're being uh, reattached and the, the most important one happens to be the age of the patient so Let's go ahead and talk about, that's for reversal, and that's the main points that I wanted to get to based on the comment that I posted about eShore reversals having a very high failure rate, having a very high atopic pregnancy rate, and having a very high uterine rupture rate. So we'll get to that part about a reversal, but first of all, I wanted to talk about tubal ligations. And this is a comment that I want to say across the board uh, to all patients, all female patients. I know that it exists for male patients, but I wanted to focus in specifically on the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology because there was another post that I posted in there about how bad the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology really is. And I've been practicing as an OBGYN for 20 years, so I have a lot of experience on what's been going on and what hasn't been done properly. I know that patients have a great deal of respect for doctors, and 
we appreciate it. Obviously, I appreciate it. Unfortunately, in the, I would have to say that in the field of obstetrics and gynecology, we are the least of um, the least group of doctors that deserve that respect and that appreciation. The reason for that is that in the field of obstetrics and gynecology, a long time ago, maybe at the time when my father was retiring as an OBGYN, we stopped having peer review and the practice of obstetrics and gynecology became a business oriented and we lost uh we're still okay here. Okay. A business oriented um and a defensive medicine oriented type of specialty. This is the reason why, despite the fact that greater than ninety eight percent of OBGYNs are board certified. Board certified means absolutely nothing because you go in, you take a test, you answer the questions the way that they want to hear those questions answered. You walk out of the of the, the board um, a test and you start practicing medicine the way you want to. And in the majority of cases, unless you're working at a university setting, and unless you're being peer reviewed, you're basically working as a business practice and in many cases, in the majority, I would have to say, of cases, the, the patient is not the most important thing of the practice. It is the, the money-making aspect of the practice. And that is why there are so many things that are wrong about obstetrics and gynecology and how and why women are getting hurt every single day because of it. This is a key thing. There's not a single thing in the field of obstetrics and gynecology that is not affected by a money-making machine and lack of peer review. Um, pregnancy in and of itself, okay, and delivery, the most important one. Women, 50% of all pregnancies are uh, delivered at this point in time by cesarean section, and 50% of those cesarean sections are unnecessary. Unnecessary, simply unnecessary. So half a million women a year are being are, are being subjected to a cesarean section when they don't need to be. And I hear it all the time. Well, my doctor said that the heart rate went down and the baby was in distress and it was an emergency and and I that's how I that's why he saved my my baby's life. And maybe maybe that doctor really did. But I can tell you that unless you were running down the hall. Uh, with with the, the the nurses on top of the stretcher and you barely remember anything about what happened as soon as you got into that OR, there's a good chance that it was, an, an, was not an emergency. Now, was it, was it necessary? Maybe it was. But the most common um, broad-ended explanations as to, as to unnecessary cesarean sections and the definitions of their, uh, their, of, are uh, fetal distress non-reassuring fetal heart tracings. And that's almost always uh, subjected to the doctors. So doctors are basically using that as a catch-all to do a cesarean section when, when they're tired of being there, when they want to go home on the weekend, when they're covering for some other doctor, uh, or, or they're going on vacation or, or the such. Okay, and that's the key there. That's with cesarean sections. Now, I could go on and on whether or not it be uh, da Vinci robot uh, use or uh, eshore permanent sterilizations or the vaginal meshes, the abdominal meshes, the hernia meshes, all of those meshes. I could go on and on, but today's subject matter is spe specifically associated with tubal ligation. So let's talk about tubal ligation. Number one, point number one, the best form of permanent sterilization is the male vasectomy. Make a t-shirt out of it. Do whatever you want to do with it. That is key. I am an OBGYN and I do tubal ligations all the time. And the first thing that I talk to my patients about is, is this really what you want? Because who should be getting uh, sterilized is going to be your partner, your husband, the boyfriend. Because the side effects related to a vasectomy far are far uh, 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 less than the side effects related to a uh, tubal ligation. And that is key related specifically to the syndrome of post-tubal ligation syndrome, which I happen to believe exists, okay? Now, with that said, vasectomy does not affect men the way that they keep uh, complaining about. And I can tell you f firsthand, because I've had a vasectomy and I've had a reversal of vasectomy. And when I had my vasectomy, I was back at work a couple hours later. And when I had my reversal of a vasectomy, 
yes, it was more difficult and I had to had to uh, take a few days off. But the fact of the matter is, it did not change who I was, how I managed, how I acted, how my strength, my libido, none of that. So men that that keep saying that that's what they don't want, that's why they don't want to have it, are just giving you uh, a lot of excuses for doing something that should should be fair, especially since um, since the mother has carried the baby or carried all of the children and has sacrificed her time, effort, her body. And the dads just uh, basically are on the sidelines supportive. But when it comes time to really doing something for the relationship, the male vasectomy is the best choice related to permanent sterilization. Hands down, that is the key thing to remember. Number two, I get questions all the time about, well, um, my doctor wouldn't do a tubal on me because I'd only had one child or I was too young. And... Um, and and so, or I wasn't allowed to have a tubal ligation because of those reasons. And that's another key thing. Another key thing to remember is that there's no law other than the fact, other than the law that you have to be an adult. There's no law that says that you have to be of a certain age to, and other than turn 18, to get a tubal ligation. Okay, you have to be competent. You have to be a sound mind. You can't be coerced into doing a tubal ligation. But other than that, it has nothing to do with how many children you've had. And if, you, if you've heard that, that the doctor told me that he wouldn't do a tubal ligation on me unless, unless I had three or four children, there's no law that says that. And it's simply at the discretion of the doctor. The doctor doesn't want to do the tubal because they're under the impression that you're going to change your mind. And a key point to remember there is that a tubal ligation is considered permanent and irreversible. So the question that I always ask patients related to the idea of getting a tubal ligation, and I know it sounds kind of morbid, but this is the this is how I always address it, is that imagine for a moment that you were by yourself. Imagine for a moment that your the man that you love was no longer there, either through divorce or loss. Would you ever imagine having another child? And in the majority of cases, patients will say. I don't want to have any more children, even if my husband or my boyfriend wasn't in the picture. I have, I've had all the children that I want to have, and I want to get my tubes tied. And that is the answer that we're talking about. If there's any hesitation with the idea that you may change your mind five years from now, ten years from now, if, especially if you were uh, by yourself or out without your husband or boyfriend, then you should wait on getting a tubal ligation. That's going, that would have eliminated more than half of all of the tubules that are done that are considered to be unnecessary. Can I drop a fan? I think it's weak in my sinus. Okay, go ahead. We're going to open the door then because we're going to oh, be sweating have... in it. No, we can just open the door. No, the dogs are going to come in. Okay. Well, we I'll can just... show them off the dogs. I'll just check okay. that out. Okay. The next thing we're talking about related to tubal ligation um, is the method in which a tubal ligation is done is very important, especially if there is any consideration of getting a tubal reversal in the future. Because nowadays, doctors are choosing to remove the entire fallopian tube as part of the tubal ligation. It's not a ligation anymore. It is cell, it's called a salpingectomy. So the tube is completely removed. And if you have, and the reason because that we've chosen to, to consider getting a, the, the entire tube removed is because we have found that in some studies that the cause of ovarian cancer seems to be associated with the, the latter half of the fallopian tube and the, or the fimbriated end that, that is very close to the ovary. So now we've, we're justifying removing the entire fallopian tube as part of a, a, a permanent sterilization. Uh, because of that particular risk of ovarian cancer, which is rather small to begin with, but that's how we're justifying it. So if a patient gets her tubes completely removed, she can't have a reversal of a tubal ligation. She's obligated to do in vitro fertilization, and we'll get to that in, in, a, in a few minutes. So if you remove the entire tube, there's no way that you can get a reversal. If you remove the fimbriated end or the fluffy end that looks like little fingers, uh, that is very close to the ovary, you can't get a reversal of a tubal ligation. It, it doesn't work, okay? If you burn the entire fallopian tube, you can't get a reversal of a tubal ligation. And as I said before, if you remove the entire tube, you can't get a reversal. Uh, in the cases of bands or some device that you're using to, to ligate, the best 
uh, outcomes occur with minimal types of damage to the fallopian tubes, which are associated with fallop, uh, uh, elastic bands, which are made out of silicone in part, uh, or the uh, Felshi clips, which are also coated with silicone, as well as titanium with, with some uh, secondary uh, metals associated with them. The Hulk eclipse, uh, or, uh, or one of those three, one of those uh, 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 different types, which minimally destroy the fallopian tube and allow for some scarring. And if you remove those, you're able to preserve a lot more of the fallopian tube and reapproximate that tissue. So that's the key related to that. Uh, if you're going to burn the tube, usually the best is you only burn one small area because then you can cut out that area and you can reapproximate the tube. The worst uh, procedures to try to reverse are going to be complete destruction of the fallopian tube or eshore uh, permanent sterilization devices because the eshore not only damages the fallopian tube but it damages the entrance into the uterus which is uh, the the uterine uh, the uterine uh, 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 tube junction area the corneal junction area and these areas are uh, necessary to be able to preserve an opening and allow for uh, fertilization to occur so the the procedures with the least likely outcomes as far as, as getting pregnant are concerned are going to be uh, the destruction of the entire tube, the destruction of the coronal area, the junction of that with the fallopian tube, uh, and both of them can, are most commonly associated with the eShore device. So you're looking at, in the cases of minimal damage to the fallopian tube, you're looking at a success rate of between 70 and 80%. Uh, with the uh, celastic bands, with the uh, Felshi clips, and with the Holka, uh, um, uh, Holka clips. And the worst outcomes with the Eshore permanent sterilization device, which has a success rate of only 30%. Now, once you reverse a fallopian, once you reverse a tube and, uh, and open it back up again, the area that you've put together where a good tissue can close back down so you have a failure and a closure again back to uh, the ligation point but that area is also permanently damaged so your risk of an atopic pregnancy can significantly occur so your risk of less than one percent with an atopic pregnancy uh, in normal circumstances significantly goes up 50 uh, excuse me a hundred times higher up to 500 times higher so it goes from less than one percent to up to 5%. And atopic pregnancy is a big deal. That's when a pregnancy occurs in the fallopian tube or outside of the fallopian tube, but not in the uterus where it's supposed to be. And an atopic pregnancy is life-threatening. First of all, you're probably going to lose the tube uh, if you have an atopic pregnancy. Number two, uh, if it gets big enough and you're not, not aware of it, you could actually have the tube rupture or the atopic pregnancy rupture, and that's life-threatening. It requires an emergency surgery to try to preserve that, um, uh, the, preserve the life of the, of the patient or the mother. So that's very important to understand there. This is, the next part is very unique to eShore permanent sterilization. In order to reverse an eShore, you have to remove the coil, obviously, and you have a certain amount of fallopian tube tissue that's still good. So what you have to do is you have to reattach that good tissue of the fallopian tube to a new part of the uterus, creating a new opening, as it were. And you do that with stents, and it, it, it's a complicated procedure, very uh, technically oriented. So some of the best doctors, Dr. Charles uh, Monteith out of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, is the a premier, uh, the eminent expert on uh, East Shore permanent sterilization reversals. So I suggest you talk to him. Unfortunately, even in the, in, the, in the best hands, one of the most severe, the most difficult, uh, the most complicated uh, and life-threatening issues can occur, and that is a uterine rupture. Since you're creating a new, a new opening, the tube attaches to that new opening, and it weakens the area around it. And so when a pregnancy does occur, as it gets larger, uh, and and possibly during uh, labor and delivery, you can have a rupture of that area and uh, permanently damage the uterus. Now, so that you get an idea of how important, how serious a uterine rupture is, uterine ruptures, if you were to have a cesarean section and you were, if you were never to have a cesarean section, a uterine rupture occurs one 
in approximately 10,000 to 50,000 times. That's how rare a uterine rupture is without having had a cesarean section. If you have a cesarean section, the probability of uterine rupture goes from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 500. So significantly increases your risk of that. So we have had protocols that say what is safe and what is not safe. If a patient gets pregnant and she's attempting to have a vaginal delivery, we consider a 1% risk of a uterine rupt a rupture to be acceptable. 1% is acceptable. And uh, we also uh, believe that 2% uterine rupture, which is associated with two previous cesarean sections, is also acceptable. That's an acceptable rate of uterine rupture. Now, if you've had three cesarean sections, the risk of uterine rupture goes up past 3%. And we consider that to be unacceptable. That's why across the United States, women with three previous cesarean sections are not allowed to labor uh, for a vaginal delivery. They have to have a repeat cesarean section. So here you go with 3% three, uh, uh, 3 risk of a uterine rupture. We do not allow a patient to labor. And yet the risk of uterine rupture with, a, with eShore reversal is 4%. And of course, the, now you have an idea of what your risk is related to one versus the other. So that's key related to that. So the key point to remember is, yes, no one is discouraging a patient from attempting uh, a reversal, uh, especially in the case of eShore. The key thing to remember is that the risk is rather high that you're going to have a complication, that it's going to fail, and the potential high risk of atopic pregnancies and also uterine rupture. That's the key related to that. So um, going back to some other points that I wanted to go over related to getting a tubal ligation, there's been some questions related to, well, I've heard that you need uh, your spouse needs to sign off on before you can have a tubal ligation done. And some state laws still have that on the books where you've got to get the permission of your spouse in order to get a tubal ligation done. However, on the federal level, federal statute and um, federal law says that, that uh, uh, federal courts have, have uh, opined that that is actually unconstitutional. So uh, government-run agencies no longer are allowed to uh, obligate a patient to get a signature of, for a tubal ligation from, uh, from the husband. Um, However, private hospitals still can require that, as can doctors. Doctors can say, I won't do the tubal ligation unless you get a signature sign off from, from your husband. And I, I know it sounds kind of um, uh, uh, prejudiced and uh, paternalistic, but that's how it is uh, in some private hospitals. And uh, talking about the private hospitals, I wanted to go on to an issue related to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, uh, I happen to believe that this particular policy is exceptionally uh, biased and hypocritical, is the fact that the Roman Catholic Church and church-sponsored hospitals do not allow for tubal ligations to occur in their facilities because they don't believe in that type of birth control. Yet, it's, it's uh, been said, and, I, and I've been told, that there are Roman Catholic-sponsored hospitals that will allow you to have an eShore permanent sterilization procedure done. eShore is a form of permanent sterilization. It's no different, technically, than sterilizing a patient by, by any other means. And yet, you're allowed to have eShore done and not allowed to have a tubal ligation done. And I happen to believe that because of this, the Roman Catholic Church is responsible in, in many cases, if this is occurring, for the obligation of women to undergo the eShore permanent sterilization procedure that was un, unnecessarily biased and hypocritical. So I'm, I'm very disappointed in the fact that if it is true that the Roman Catholic Church will allow a patient to have an eShore uh, sterilization done in their hospital but won't allow a traditional tubal ligation, that hospital is equally responsible for the outcomes of those women that ended up with problems with eShore permanent sterilization. So that was my key related to that. Now, a next comment is, do I believe in post-tubal ligation syndrome and why isn't it easier to confirm post-tubal ligation syndrome? Yes, I do believe in post-tubal ligation syndrome. I've done more than 2,000 tubal ligations. I have seen maybe two 
to 3% patients that have had symptoms of post tubal ligation syndrome. The most common ones are going to be um, changes in their menstrual cycle. Uh, pelvic pain during the menstruation becomes more painful, uh, pain with intercourse. I haven't seen the cognitive changes, the emotional changes, the excessive weight gain with post-tubal ligation syndrome, but um, I do equate the problems with post-tubal ligation syndrome similar to the inflammatory responses that are associated with a foreign body reactions from the fallope uh, thalastic bands, from the Felsch eclipse, from the Hulk eclipse, uh, and uh, of course, from like I said, from East Shore. So, why is it why is it so difficult to to find or to try to narrow down post tubal ligation syndrome? It's because we still haven't been able to find the cause of it if it does exist in a particular patient. And I happen to believe that the ligation syndrome is associated with an inflammatory response. So we do see them much more common in the issues if you're using a, a, a celastic band or a silicone band or a Felsch eclipse or the Hulk eclipse or the East Shore device. Those cause inflammatory responses both locally and also chronically, systemically. So if someone is telling you or you're arguing the ladies that, are, uh, that have Felsch eclipse, Hulk eclipse and celastic bands in place and you're saying, my doctor won't take these out, well, it's probably because your doctor doesn't understand that this is causing a foreign body reaction. And if it has any nickel in it, it's part of the um, systemic nickel allergy syndrome. And all of these fall under the umbrella of um, autoimmune inflammatory uh, syndrome induced by adjuvants or Asia. And we as OBGYNs haven't even heard of this. We don't, we, don't, we don't manage patients with inflammatory responses, and so we can't put two and two together. We can't associate putting a Felshi clip on a patient to that patient having severe weight gain and uh, severe pelvic pain and uh, uh, severe vaginal bleeding during their menstrual cycles. What we have found, and I've, I've actually had patients that have had the symptoms of metallic taste, uh, chronic pelvic pain, excessive weight gain, uh, half an hour to an hour after we remove the Felsch clips, the patient doesn't doesn't notice the metallic taste anymore, and she's and she doesn't have any more pelvic pain. And within a month, she's back to doing everything that she wanted to do prior to um, uh, getting her tubal ligation done. The same applies to the Hulk clips and to the celastic bands. The worst case scenarios are associated with Eshore permanent sterilization uh, because that is a an intentional foreign body reaction caused by the Eshore device. And so that's key related to that. So yes, I do believe in post-tubal ligation syndrome. It's very difficult to prove because there's no significant study that has been supported of that particular situation. Uh, however, the removal of the foreign body uh, and reversal of the of of the um, uh, removal of the scar tissue and reversal uh, uh, and opening up the tube back up seems to significantly improve the foreign body reaction, inflammatory reaction. What's also key to understand is that it doesn't happen in everyone because there's a genetic predisposition to a foreign body reaction as is the severity of that foreign body reaction. For example, if you, if you know someone that's allergic to penicillin, not everyone is allergic to penicillin, but there is a group of people that are. Same thing with peanuts or, or other types of, of, of uh, 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 things that they take, ingestion of food or medications, uh, and those allergic responses from that person is individualized on a genetic level as well, as I said, on, a, on an in individual level and cannot be generalized. So where a doctor says, well, I've never seen an issue with a, f a Felshi clip, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist for that particular person. And that's key to understand uh, related to the foreign body reaction. I've also always recommended that, that tubal ligations uh, uh, be done using either cautery or... Uh, uh, absorbable material uh, rather than a foreign body such as a Felshi clip or, or Eshore permanent sterilization device because um, there's less likely to cause an inflammatory response. Another point of interest is that we have found that the that immune response uh, to the, the tubal ligation appears to exist from the moment you damage the tube and it's it's associated with a cascade of antibodies the most common one in the studies that are associated with IgA antibodies, IgA, an immunoglobulin A uh, type of antibody. 
Again, this is over the head of most doctors because they've never even heard of it. And so it's very difficult for for us that are shooting in the in, in the dark to try to explain what's going on as far as the foreign body reaction and post tubal ligation syndrome to our patients. So that's key to remember in this particular circumstance. Yes, I do believe in PTLS, and I do believe that it can be treated by a reversal. And uh, there's only a certain number of doctors that are really, really good at reversing tubes. And here we get back into the idea of uh, reversing a tube. I've seen plenty of ads where it says $1,800 for a tube of reversal. Now, anybody can reverse the tube. Now, whether or not it stays open is, the, is, is what we're talking about in this scenario. So uh, I can reverse a tube, but I'm no expert in reversing it so that the, the tube remains open and that the patient can have a successful pregnancy to follow. So this is where um, that, that you have to buyer beware is important because it can be done, but to be done well enough to get you pregnant is the key to, to what we have to understand and what's going on here. And as I told you before, the, uh, the key things to remember, how much of the tube was destroyed, how much of the tube is still good, because what the studies have suggested is that if you have between a 5 and a 7.5 centimeters of good tube, that's the, the best chance that you're going to be able to reverse the tubal ligation and you're be, going to have a successful uh, pregnancy because of it. If it's less than 2.5 centimeters left of your tube that's, that's good, it's unlikely that you're going to get pregnant. You're less than a 30, 38 to 40% chance that you're going to get pregnant with just a little piece left like that. Um, the, and age is exceptionally important related to this. Women that are under the age of 30 have a 70 to 80% chance that they're going to be able to reverse their tubes and have a successful pregnancy. And unfortunately, women over the age of 40 have less than a 40% chance that they're going to be able to get pregnant uh, after a reversal. Even if it was a successful reversal, they're less likely to get pregnant because of that. So that's why women are charged six to $7,000 by the experts on how to reverse a tube because they're the ones with the most success rates. The issue, however, the problem with that is that I haven't seen a single doctor publish his total results except for Dr. Charles Monteith uh, out of North Carolina. So all of these experts at the tubal reversal, put your money where your mouth is, post your stats, uh, because I've seen plenty of, uh, I've gone to the websites and I've seen plenty of them where they got baby after baby after baby after baby success. Well, that may be five babies, but you did a hundred tubal reversals. So you're only batting 5%. How do you know how many, how many successful uh, outcomes you've had if you don't show them how many you started with, how many tubals did you actually reverse, and how many babies did you actually end up with. So I'm always skeptical about doctors that are not willing to put their stats in writing, and it's important for you to get that in writing. If you're going to ask a doctor to reverse your tubal ligation, ask them, I want to see any published work that you have and confirming that what your tubal ligation rate is, success rate for pregnancy. That's very important to me. And Doctors that are not willing to put it in writing, you probably should go to a different doctor because uh, if they're not able to put it in writing, I really wouldn't believe that their stats are, are accurate or truthful or honest. And again, we go back to the issues of the honesty of the field of obstetrics and gynecology. So I pretty much believe that I covered the, 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 the notes that I had written about tubal ligation, tubal reversal, and the complications um, related to trying to reverse as well as the success rate of attempting a reversal of a tubal ligation. If your reversal fails, um, then, and you, you usually will get pregnant within one year of a tubal reversal. If it's taken more than a year, it's less likely to be successful. But Mother Nature and, and is, is awesome. Where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, God helps out a lot, and you can, uh, uh, you can still get pregnant doesn't mean you won't, but you, it, it becomes more difficult. And the last thing related to that is that if you're not able to get pregnant by a tube of reversal, in vitro fertilization is, is the next best choice, but it's very expensive. Each month that you're attempting a, a, a um, pregnancy by in vitro fertilization averages about $10,000. And that's why a lot of women prefer to try for the tubal reversal because they've invested $6,000 with the chance that they can try for an entire year as opposed or compared to uh, in vitro fertilization, which costs $10,000 
and you have to get the assistance of the doctor each time that you're trying to do that. So that's a comparative price between it. And in vitro fertilization also has a success rate between 30 and 60 percent. The more embryos you put in, the, the higher chance that you're going to be able to get pregnant, but the higher chance that you're going to have uh, twins or triplets, and that's an even more complicated and more expensive uh, potential uh, issue of risk. So I think we're good there. We've spoken for 40 minutes. Are there any questions? Yeah. If I have Please. To I'm sorry. She's, she looks like she's suffering. She's been uh, getting over a, a terrible um, cold and flu symptoms for a couple of days, but she's She's helped me out here, and I appreciate it. I can't even read these. You can't read? Uh, how can patients improve or require more peer review feedback to their doctor to compensate for changes that have occurred in the OBGYN field? That, uh, do we well, you want to answer that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Number one, um, hospital-based, uh, excuse me, university-based programs, uh, uh, Parkland and, um, and uh, Dallas, uh, the uh, Cincinnati system, uh, the uh, uh, UCLA, all of the uh, uh, university-based programs have peer review. Okay, all of the residents. Wherever you got a resident, you may not, you not may not be comfortable with a resident uh, uh, managing your care. But a, a resident, a program, a hospital that has a residency program also has private attendings. But almost always. There's going to be a very strong medical director that's going to make sure that those doctors are practicing evidence-based medicine, okay? The least likely place to have peer review is going to be in the private hospitals because doctors basically work by a democracy. So if, if 60 doctors sit down and say, I don't want peer review, then the hospital is going to do what they're, they're asking and they're not going to be any peer review and then there's then that's why the problem exists. If you have hospitalists uh, which work for the hospital, they're going to be peer reviewed as well because they're trying to keep the, the complication rates down. And that's very, very important related to that. So um, the key thing to remember is you're going to have to not go by board certification, not go by word of mouth. I always say, Get it in writing. And that's going to narrow your field of 100 doctors down to just a few doctors. But maybe they're the ones that you should pick. Maybe the instead of having 100 doctors that are not very busy, you should have 10 doctors that are very busy because they're the ones that have dedicated their time and effort to, to doing what is right, evidence-based medicine, and putting it in writing. Uh, that's the key. So the reason I'm saying forget about peer, uh, excuse me, forget about board certification. Remember that 98% of all doctors are board certified. So 98% of the doctors that are taking advantage of their patients are board certified. Okay, that's the, that's the basic point. I mean, board certification does not carry any weight if there's no peer review and 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 there's nobody watching what they're doing, and that's the key. So to answer your question. Try to pick uh, programs that are that are um, that are university based, that have hospitalists, and that doctors that are willing to put whatever they're doing in writing, sign and date for you to to have as some type of evidence that a conversation did occur, and then these doctors are really uh, putting their money where their mouth is. Um, oh, she went on to say, how do we get? True informed consent and further research when doctors and ACOG don't believe in PTLS. Do you believe research will first need to prove PTLS real before we see changes in consent and doctors refuse to accept or believe? What, what ACOG and what um, doctors are falling back on is the CREST study that was done uh, back in the um, 19, 1978 to 1986 and the published studies the results from 1996. That's the biggest study that evaluated uh, like uh, permanent sterilization in women. And the CREST study basically showed, uh, suggested that, uh, that the incidence or the prevalence, I'm sorry, the prevalence of abnormal bleeding is actually lower in women who have gotten tubal ligation. And as soon as doctors heard that, they said post-tubal ligation, do uh, uh, post ligation syndrome doesn't exist. Okay, because the CREST study doesn't support it. So 
smaller studies have suggested it, but nothing as large as that. And so I guess that if the Crest study, because that was more than 20 years ago, if the Crest study were to be repeated, uh, that would be the best, the, the, the turning point. My suggestion is that the, 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 uh, the specialty of immunology should be involved to show on a cellular level what's going on with an immune response that may explain why uh, post-tubal ligation syndrome is a real thing. What are signs of an ectopic pregnancy? Atopic pregnancy, the most common sign. Well, first of all, you're going to probably miss your period or having light bleeding. But the one that's worse and the most, most serious is going to be pelvic pain. If you've missed your period or you've had light bleeding or something's unusual about your period and you're having any type of pain, you should get evaluated as soon as possible. For example, that's the reason why uh, Danielle and I always accept patients as soon as they miss their period. Uh, we, we do an ultrasound and to see how far along they are. If we can't see a pregnancy right away, we have them come back the following week or we have them do serial blood work to find out how, how high the beta HCG count is going and follow along that way. But the most severe and the most uh, dangerous one is going to be pe uh, pelvic pain because that's a potential sign that the atopic can rupture. What about periods for 14 days every month with old blood each time? As a sign? I guess. No, uh, periods that are four. That's what she means. Okay, periods that are fourteen days uh, uh, long have to do with uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding, and not specifically in a topic. Uh, so that has to be addressed by a hormonal uh, adjustment, rather than that you actually got pregnant, and that's what's causing the the bleeding like that. Okay, I think this is a question. <laughs> what to do when the device has been removed but the rest of the hormonal things and other not metal reaction stuff still goes on and cannot gain weight for the life of me and every test comes back negative. Getting super confused the more I think I'm figuring this out. Sorry if my wording is off. My mentality has been drastically affected by this. Uh, as far as removal, does it sound like she removed a, a metal device? Yeah, probably a clip or... Okay. Hold on, let me go back to see. I don't know. I can't well, let's, let's generalize the question because there are some women that uh, still notice that they still have problems uh, removing uh, the removal of a... after the removal of a metallic device, such as the Felshi clip, Hoka clip, uh, or the e short device. Um, these farm body reactions can induce or trigger or make worsen a situation that already... Uh, the, the patient was already predisposed to have or has. So even though you remove the, the, the metallic component, it doesn't mean that the patient has not been permanently sensitized to the autoimmune reaction. Um, that's why even with the removal of the devices, there's about 20 to 30 percent of women still have these symptoms. Luckily, 70 to 80 percent of women don't, but Unfortunately, they fall back into this 20 or 30 percent that do. So I always recommend that you do a full immunological evaluation, test for thyroid problems, test for lupus problems, test for uh, 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 Sjogren's syndrome, test for um, fibromyalgia um, and uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, all of those uh, antibodies that are associated with that syndrome, uh, test for Raynaud's syndrome, and that's an, uh, a combined uh, multi-specialty effect of the gynecologist, rheumatologist, and immunologist. One of them, one, one test that's not commonly done because it's been more focused on a skin test is called the Melissa test, which is going to look at um, T cells and how they respond to metals or uh, an agent that's, a, that's, a, that's an, causing an inflammatory response. So uh, the, the Melissa test can be used to test for uh, allergies to titanium, to, to chromium, to nickel, uh, to, um, to iron, or stainless steel, for example. So this is key and related to that. So I would try to sit down and have a multi-specialty co conversation or at least talk to the different specialties and address the possibility of um, doing these tests or addressing the fact that what can we do to do additional testing to see if that they might be able to explain what's happening. 
The tubal ligations you perform during C-sections, can they be reversible and successful? Successful. Not mine. Okay, I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. I do not do a tubal ligation so that it can be reversed. I, I always make sure that I've had a, an extensive discussion with my patient that this is her final decision because the worst case scenario is that the tubal was done not properly and this patient ends up with an atopic pregnancy or a pregnancy that she did not want and then we run into issues related to an unwanted pregnancy and the potential issues of abortion. And that's why when I do a tubal, it's permanent, irreversible, and maximized. Uh, now, can you do, have a tubal ligation done right after a cesarean section and uh, take only a piece out? Yes, of course. Those are um, the Parkland technique um, and uh, as, as one of the more common ones. Um, but uh, the less you remove for the ligation, the more likely it is that you can get it reversed. Uh, why doesn't a reversal always help women with PTLS get relieved of her symptoms due to hormones and age? Well, there's a combination. I, I, I don't like it when a patient is told, especially a young patient, it's because of your... Uh, did we lose somebody? What okay. No, it just blinked out, says a lost connection. Um, okay. Okay. So, uh, yes, like I said, you have, to, you have to test for all of those other p potential uh, issues as to why your symptoms are still there. Because, unfortunately, 20 to 30% of women have underlying autoimmune conditions that have yet not presented themselves. One of the most common is going to be lupus. I know a lot of people don't know what lupus is, but that can affect up to 20% of women as they get older and more likely to affect them as they get older. So fibromyalgia, 30% of women can suffer from fibromyalgia as they get older. Uh, hypothyroidism is very common. Hyper or hypothyroidism is very common as a potential issue. So this is key to understand that even though the tubal was, was reversed, the underlying autoimmune condition may still be present. Do we take patients from out of town? Yeah, of Only course. If their insurance allows them to be seen here, right? Yes. A, a limitation related to that is um, insurances because we, we, we really pride ourselves on trying to help patients out. Um, and we, I mean, for example, we take IUDs out for free as part of the medical charity that we, we, we uh, were um, a part of. Um, uh, free condoms, uh, Consultations for eShore uh, permanent sterilization uh, are free consults, okay? But there's only so much that I can do because anything that requires surgery requires the patient to have to pay for hospital stay, and that becomes much more difficult. But just like we do these videos, I answer a lot of questions uh, through email uh, or for Facebook, and uh, that's important to me because I think that, that that's the key. If, if only... 5% of doctors did what I'm doing, we wouldn't have the problems that we're having. That's the bottom line. It's just that, and, and ACOG is to blame. I think ABOG is to blame because they're not policing their members, their fellows. And if they did put, uh, put more pressure on the scale, doctors would, would uh, come around and start doing, uh, doing right by their patients. If I get a reversal and have to pay all that money to feel better, what if my tubes close later on down the road after surgery? And I'm, and I'm left in pain and in debt again. What are the odds of tubes closing later down the road? Well, again, the odds of them closing are, are associated with the, 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 the statements that I originally, uh, originally said. The age of the patient, the amount of uh, scar tissue that was originally present, uh, the sc scarring around that particular uh, 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 fallopian tube, uh, and the skill of the doctor doing the procedure. Uh, Again, Dr. Charles Monteith out of uh, uh, North Carolina has posted his particular stats, has published his particular stats, and he has uh, a 70 to 80 percent uh, success rate of pregnancy uh, related to the um, uh, a reversal of a, of a clip. Uh, that doesn't mean that the tube has closed, but you're still looking at a good 80 percent chance that the, the tube will stay open. But let's try to address something. Just because the tube closes doesn't mean the problem wasn't fixed. The, the inflammation that, that was the original insult, especially if it's a foreign body, may be what the problem was. And by doing the operation to try to put the tissue back together again and let a natural scarring 
uh, occur, maybe all that's necessary. So I wish that I could give you a better, better odds or better options related to that, but I'm suggesting that even in the case where the tube will close, doesn't mean that you're not going to still have that benefit of the reversal, sim uh, reversal of the symptoms. Uh, how common is it to have four Felshi clips, please? Four. Uh, pretty common because the Felshi clips are known to pop off. And so doctors uh, have decided, well, two is better than one. So they put two on one side, two on the other. However, now you've doubled your, your exposure to a foreign body, and we just didn't know that we were doing wrong. So to tell you that it's a, uh, something that shouldn't be done, well, the manufacturer said there's, that there's nothing wrong with that. So it's not necessarily the fault of the doctor. But what's uh, an, another thing that I forgot to mention, always properly understand what your doctor is doing, what technique he's doing. Because if you were expecting the doctor to tie your tube and the doctor put a felshi clip on, that's not the same procedure. You did not get informed consent or you did not give informed consent. If you were expecting the, your tube to be tied and your doctor put a felshi clip, a Hulka clip, a, 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 fallop, um, a celastic band on or eshore permanent sterilization, you did not give informed consent. That's medical battery for all intents and purposes. But because we've arbitrarily decided it's so nonchalant about getting tubal ligations done or doing tubal ligations, we have cut informed consent down to a single page and don't properly explain what we're doing. There's a lot of women that think that, oh, if I get my tubes tied, I can get them untied. That's not how it works. Once you tie a tube, you strangulate the tube, you permanently damage the tube and it's scarred. So even whatever caused that, that, that scarring to, to, to occur, it dissolves, the, the suture falls off you, you're not untying something. Okay, that's the key that related to that. Uh, if you put a, a felshi clip on, it's the same thing as tying. It damages the tube, and that's what leads to the, to, to the sterilization. So you can't simply tie and untie. And also, if you told your doctor that I wanted you to burn my tube, but he, but he, but he puts a felshi clip on, that's just as bad. He needs to tell you how he's, or she, needs to tell you how they're going to do it, and what are the what are the odds that it's going to work? And if you did want to reverse it, what would the odds be of reversing that particular procedure that the doctor's doing? Uh, can you get a reversal with the Esher trailing into your uterus? What about it shattering into hundreds of pieces? Okay, the again I keep mentioning his name. I hope Charles uh, is is out there listening. Charles uh, Monteith is the expert on this, an uh, eminent ex expert on this. But what happens is this. You core out, the, the part that's trailing into the uterus, you core it out and you gently take it out of the uterus. Uh, uh, and then you uh, put the new, um, uh, the new tube or that you've created into an area near to where you cored it out or uh, depending on exactly how the, the shape of the uterus is. So you can close the defect and create a new opening if you needed to but the key is do not pull on the coil and uh, do not cut the coil. You have to core it out or you have to gently tease it out. But pulling on it really hard or cutting the coil is not supposed to happen. And especially if the doctor is telling you that they're going to go in through the, uh, the, the uterus, through the, uh, through the vagina using a hysteroscope, that's contraindicated to cut a coil. Uh, uh, first of all, the instruments were never designed to cut metal. But doctors are using uh, uh, instruments that can cut metal to cut metal, and that's simply not what they were designed to do. So you can fragment it, uh, but you have to get a clear understanding of what the doctor's going to do, how they're going to do it, and especially in the cases of trying to pull these coils out, the doctor should have gotten studies done at least 30 days before the procedure's done, an ultrasound and a CT scan to know exactly where the coils are and uh, how many there are, and then Intraoperatively, the doctor should be getting a, a, a fluoroscopy done to make sure that, the, that he or she has not cut the coil accidentally, fragmented the coil, and uh, get the assistance of interventional radiology to help you if you have left a piece behind so that that, that doesn't become a, a, a question or concern a month later when the, when the patient is told then, hey, I left a piece behind. Not a big deal. It, of course, is a big deal. Of course, it's a big deal, and it could have been avoided if the doctor had thought ahead and done some uh, the the pre-operative 
uh, followed a preoperative protocol that would minimize this particular complication? Uh, what advice do you have for someone who bleeds all the time? I bled for 87 days straight with no letting up and became severely anemic. This happens frequently and always. I've always had two periods 10 to 12 days long a month. Okay, if it's related to a tubal, the, and depending on your age, this is where it's important to understand that sometimes just medication is going to be a short-term answer to a, to a long-term problem. But of course, you check your hormones and make sure that, that you're not suffering from hypothyroidism, your, your hormone levels from the menstrual cycle are normal. Uh, the consideration of um, an ablation, as long as you don't have uh, eShore device in place, is possible. Ultimately, if medication is not working and I've gone through uh, the use of medication, I don't really recommend ablation because I've seen a lot of side effects with that, especially the post-ablation tubal ligation syndrome, which is an actually another syndrome where the tube is closed off and there's a little space between where you're ablating and where the tube is closed that can cause severe bleeding and severe pain. So many times, and I know a lot of women don't want to hear this, many times I opt or recommend a hysterectomy to take care of it uh, as, a, as a final solution. One final thing, I'm sorry, I, I, I promised someone that I would mention uh, why do women have bladder associated problems with a hysterectomy. In many cases it's because you have to push the bladder off of the uterus in order to get the uterus out and when you push on the bladder you're, you're severing uh, minimal, um, minimally sized nerve endings um, and, and, and a matrix of nerves and vessels uh, on, a, on, a, on a microscopic level and this disrupts the ability of the bladder to function normally. That's why I prefer to do a subtotal hysterectomy and try to avoid really doing anything to the bladder and just removing the uterus which is responsible for the bleeding. Again, that's a matter of a judgment call between you and your doctor as long as you understand all of the risks. It's really the most important thing is for you to know everything that you can know about it. It be properly explained to you as far as part, as part of informed consent. And then from there, make a decision on what you're going to do. Is there a treatment or medication for those who can get a device removed, who can't get a device removed, fragments, or possibly another form of implants related to joints? Uh, the, for, for a joint implant? I don't know. Is there a treatment or medication for those who can't get a device removed? Fragments or possibly another form of implants related to joints? Okay. I don't recommend... There's a general protocol related to foreign bodies as far as bleeding is concerned. And uh, putting in another uh, device such as an IUD, uh, when you already have an eShore device, when you already have a Felshi uh, clips, and they're already causing problems, I don't believe in the use of an IUD... Uh, I, I recommend just taking out the devices you can. There is no particular medicine that can help you to offset the foreign body reaction, although in many cases patients that are being treated with steroid therapy, which I don't recommend in and of itself, but steroids seem to suppress the inflammatory response and some patients feel better, but it's associated with an excessive amount of weight gain and uh, increased risk of diabetes. So I wish that I could give you the that there's a medicine that you can take to offset these problems, but in reality, we don't have that yet. I had a patch test done and was positive to nickel and cobalt. Now my doctor has not said I was allergic to the clips. They refused to tell me. Can you please tell me? Can you please tell if it was the clips I was allergic to? I think I am right in saying I was. Um, Felshi clips and a, a variety of different clips, even surgical clips, are not pure titanium. They have nickel components. And if there's even a little bit of nickel in a particular uh, implant, yes, that can cause uh, the foreign body reaction. And specifically, again, systemic nickel allergy syndrome. That is specifically associated to any allergic reaction to nickel. And the symptoms to that are going to be contact dermatitis or an inflammatory response uh, of, uh, of the skin. And intestinal symptoms, like uh, symptoms that mimic Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, uh, and irritable bowel syndrome. So if you tested positive for, on a nickel patch test, there's a good chance that you would, uh, that, that you would have an allergy to the fe uh, Felshi clips uh, or any other uh, clip or metallic component that has nickel in it. And the Melissa test might be able to give you a, a more uh, accurate 
or, or supporting documentation on whether or not you uh, had an allergy to it. Had Phil she clips 25 years ago. Since then, I've had Lyme, Fibro, RA, and more. Can the clips be the cause of my autoimmune diseases, and can I get them out? I would say yes, because I've seen what happens when you remove the clips. I would say yes, because I've been reading all of the immunology reports related to biomaterials. Again, key thing to remember, every single implant that you have in your body causes a foreign body reaction. And if you're showing signs of an autoimmune response, even if it's not being caused by the foreign body, it can get worse because of the foreign body. So I routinely remove any foreign body that I can remove as a GYN doctor for patients that show autoimmune uh, symptoms. If you have a reversal and have very high nickel in your system, will this be transferred to a baby? No, it's not expected to be transferred to the baby. However, we're, we're concerned about the, uh, the direct contact autoimmune reactions that may be occurring during pregnancy uh, uh, from, the, from the nickel component to the baby. Uh, that inflammatory response, what, what effect it is having on, pre on pregnancies, we don't know yet. We don't have that much research. Now, there are medications that can reduce the amount of nickel that you have in your, in your, um, in your uh, system, as well as there is a list of, of foods that have a significant high content of nickel. If you reduce the nickel that you eat in your diet, and believe me, there's a lot of stuff that has it. Even chocolate has a high concentration of nickel in it. If you start changing your diet, you may notice an improvement in your symptoms. Uh, can trouble be the cause of Hashimoto's? There, there's no direct association with that, but again, if it was, if your tubal was done by a, um, by the use of a foreign body such as the Felshi clips or Eshore per, uh, permanent sterilization device, it could worsen the underlying Hashimoto's that's, that's already there. What about neurological issues like Bell's palsy? Neurolo we do know that there are neurological symptoms associated with it because we are now, in the past couple years, we've seen that there is a specific and direct association between the lymphatic system and the brain, okay? We didn't, we didn't think, we thought that it was a separate, that the lymph nodes and all the rest of the body, that, though, that they did not exist, there wasn't a communication directly with the brain. But we have found in the past couple years that that does exist. So patients notice with a foreign body reaction, cognitive changes, memory lapses, Alzheimer's disease type uh, uh, um, symptoms, uh, many strokes, uh, transient ischemic attacks, uh, even uh, epilepsy. So I would suggest that, yes, there is an association. We are just in the infancy of proving it. But the immunologists, like I said, and those studying it in, in animal models have been able to duplicate these uh, foreign body reactions to explain the, the question that you're asking. Okay, that's really fine. Do now. All right. Okay, well, I'm sorry we have to finish today. Um, I really appreciate all of the questions. Please share all of this, especially my opening um, comment. Uh, I wish that I could tell you you could trust us. Uh, we are human as, as doctors, but uh, we're not we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing and uh, we need to do better and patients just have to be more cynical uh, about, about how we're managing you because in the end, you're the one that's going to have to deal with the consequences of us either not knowing what we're doing or doing something wrong. And that's what's key because you have to stand up for yourself and, and, and be your best advocate, your uh, most important advocate. Um, one last comment. Uh, I'm, I, is a shout out to the ladies from the uh, the breast uh, breastfeeding um, groups. I know that there's some questions related to that. I'm a cosmetic surgeon. Uh, I place my implants underneath the, the the muscle, and therefore my patients can breastfeed. We can go into a separate issue on breast implants as far as foreign body reactions, but uh, that was keyly important to that. And um, I welcome the breastfeeding. Um, uh, groups to ask any questions if they want to if they want to do a live as well thank you <laughs> let's, go shoot let's have a clap let's have a clap for danielle she does want to she want to she want to cut her head off they even hear you. They just yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for uh joining in uh, hopefully we'll do a live very soon thank you bye <laughs> <laughs> thank you bye-bye